Uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, give the lecture series here. Well, that's the talk you imposed on me. So I'm supposed uh, to talk about representations of PRD groups, but I was also supposed to start with real Lie groups as a comparison. And so this talk is supposed to uh, a bit like um, Vite Gang's talk to show you something more explicit rather than the big abstract stuff. So what is the setting? Um, F will be a local field. It will soon be a non-Archimedean field, but for the beginning we take an arbitrary local field and then G is a connected reductive group. over the local field, and we want to study the representations of these groups. And so when I talk about representations, so um, representations, representation should always mean, um, means so smooth or continuous in the real world. Representation with complex coefficients. So I will not repeat smooth and continuous all the time. And I will work with complex coefficients, but essentially everything I'm doing for the PRD groups works also model. Uh, you're welcome to ask me about that if you're interested in it. Mod P, everything looks very different. So let's recall first from Olivier Taibbi's talk, his series last week, he introduced the basic notions of the representation theory and he told us that there are different classes of representations. So on top there are all the representations, so let's just focus for this talk on the irreducible representations. And as I said, now I mean smooth representation or continuous representations on a Hilbert space or GK modules. And well inside there we have then the unitarizable, unitarizable representations or irreducible representations. So those that can be made unitary. Inside there we have the tempered representations and inside there, uh oh, when I later move the blackboard things will get screwed up. Inside there we have the, um, he called it square integrable representations square integrable representations, well I said irreducible, which are also often called discrete series. So these are, this is a different name for this, this class of representations. And then inside there we have the supercuspidal representations. Um, irreducible representations with, well, since I said that we work with unitary representations here, I would have to say uh, with unitary central character, but that's, well, you can do the same without central uh, unitary central character and then say essentially square integral representations here and um, essentially tempered representations above. And so we learned how to get from one step to the other via parabolic induction. And we also learned that these supercuspular representations these are the building blocks of everything else. We learned that every other irreducible representation can be embedded into the parabolic induction of a supercuspular representation. And so this is essentially what they knew already when Covalis took place, but what they didn't know back then was how to actually construct these supercuspular representations. And let me see, I, I wrote down a quote. So back then someone wrote that, um, well, they won't talk about the explicit construction of supercuspular representations, well, because not much was known back then. And the quote, one can expect to meet here difficult and deep arithmetical questions which are barely uncovered. So that was the status back then that they didn't really know how to write down these supercuspular representations. And this will be what my talk series is about, to uncover what these supercuspular representations are and bring you to, um, to the current state of art, tell you what the current state of art is. All right, so let's see. No, <laughs> well, imagine it's still there. All right, so what I want to do is I want to first tell you 
recall a bit what we know about the real world. So let's start with the motivation from the real, well, <laughs> the real world. I told the others over lunch that I once gave a talk at the IES and called it a talk for non-expert because it was supposed to be a talk for mathematicians who are not working in my area. But it was posted on YouTube and then people complained that, well, if you're not a mathematician, you don't understand anything. So it can't be for non-experts. So I, maybe we got some comments that this is not the real world afterwards on YouTube. So for me, real world means that f is equal to r. Um, what do we know in that case? So first of all, there are no supercuspidal representations. So well, the next best thing we can then look at are the square integrable representation, the discrete steers. And these are rather well understood. So there's the theorem Harishandra from the 60s. So that's something that was known at Covalis, which says that, well, first of all, discrete series square integral representation exists if and only if there is a uh, exist the maximal torus in our real Lie group that is elliptic. So that is anisotropic mod center. So um, square integrable or so square integrable representations exists if and only if G contains G is now our real Lie group. G contains um, maximal um, so the other way around, an elliptic, elliptic, so that means an isotropic mod center, a compact mod center. Center, maximal torus. And let's give this torus a name and let's call it S. All right, um, and so in the case that that such an elliptic torus exists, he also gave a parametrization, a classification of the discrete series representations. So the the square integrable, or the essentially, so essentially means up to twist by character to make the char um, character unitary. Essentially, square integrable representations, um, I mean irreducible throughout, I talk about irreducible representations, are parameterized by the following data. It's a pair consisting of theta character and phi plus a choice of positive roots. So where theta by this pair where theta is the character of our torus and phi plus is a choice of positive positive roots inside well inside capital capital phi which is just the root system with respect to, to s so the absolute root system, so base change to C for that. So the absolute root system. Such that theta is actually positive for that. So such that, such that if we pair our character, let's take the derivative of our character and pair it with the core root inside this positive chamber, um, core root, then this is greater or equal to zero for all alpha inside our positive system. So the picture, the, let's see, just the picture would be this is SL3, and say we have alpha, beta, alpha plus beta are positive roots. Then 
the derivative of this character would lie in the cone where beta is positive, so it has to be above here, and alpha is positive. So inside here is where the character lies. And so the square integral representations, they are parameterized by this data, and they are determined. So let's give them the square of uh, parameterized by this. And um, let's say, um, call it pi sub s um, theta and phi plus. Can you read that down here? OK, if not, shout at me. I, I'm no longer sitting in the back, so I can't do the shouting for you. <laughs> Um, and this representation, so Harishandra didn't construct the representation, but he showed just that it exists by giving its character. This representation is determined by its character, and the character is given as follows. It's the character of this representation. So recall the character um, was introduced by Olivier Tabi. Um, this is basically the trace of the representation. It's a priori a distribution, but it was shown by Harishandra that it's representable by a function on the regular semi-simple elements of the group, and it uniquely determines the representation. And so this is actually given by the following formula that might look familiar to you um, for gamma inside the torus regular semi-simple. And the formula is, well, I forgot the sign. There's just the sign in front, plus minus one. Minus one to one half the dimension of G mod K, mod its maximal compact subgroup. And then we sum over, what do we sum over? We sum over all the elements in the normalizer of the torus, mod out by the torus. And what do we sum? We sum over the character evaluated at W gamma. So W gamma is just W gamma W inverse. And we need some normalizing factor, which is the product over all alpha inside phi plus. So that's where this positive root system comes into the game, for one minus alpha of, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, guys. Can you still read that? Yes. Uh, the people are uh, shy to say no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me, so there's a product here, and this product is the product over all the positive roots of 1 minus alpha of evaluated at the gamma conjugate, uh, W conjugate of gamma inverse. No, I think that's, as I, d I don't think, I mean, the representation, of course, you look at square integral representations, there's an equivalence relation on. So they are equivalent if their GK modules are equivalent. But I don't. What happens if gamma is not in S but in some other torus? If gamma is not in S but in some other torus, it's a good question. Um, people know how to write down a character formula as well, but I don't know <laughs> out of the top of my head how to write it down. Um, it's there, I, there is some formula, but it's much more difficult. But actually, it turns out that this is already determining the representation. All right. So that's, that's the real story. Uh, so if I fix the theta, then the gamma plus we have a lot of choices with phi plus. Oh, yeah, so that's a good question. If we fix the theta, do we have a lot of choices? And so in most cases, we don't have any choice, because if, 
if the state lies inside the cone and not on the border of the cone, then it's gi uh, that gives to us already what the positive roots are. The only choice that we have is if it's in the borderline case, if it lies on one of the walls. So let me actually write that down. Maybe on the topmost blackboard. K is the maximal compact subgroup. Yeah. It's not, it's a sign anyway, so. Um, so if we mark, excellent, we mark if we actually have that the pairing of d theta with d alpha shock is not zero for all roots alpha. So if we are really inside this open cone and not at, on the walls, then Pi of s theta, then maybe let me write this like that, then pi of s theta is already determined by just that information. So this is equal to pi of s theta phi plus for unique phi plus. So phi plus is determined in that case by theta. So that means these representations, so this is determined by theta only. So these representations are parameterized by an elliptic torus, which actually in the real world, the elliptic torus S is unique up to conjugation, so it's not really a choice. And this character. So that's the, that's the real world. That's something we, we knew um, when Corvallis happened. And now there is this big idea, which is called Harish Chandra Lefchitz principle. And as I've learned from Eris' talk at the beginning of the summer school, principles are the best type of thing because you don't have to prove them and they're not even true always. But this principle is actually more miracle, I think. So what does the principle say? The principle says that um, the representations of real and of periodic groups should show parallels. And this is actually mind blowing because, well, you might have encountered real E groups, you might have encountered periodic groups, and they are just so different. The topology is just so different. And we, we saw there are not even supercastular representations in the real world. But nevertheless, some magic happens. So let me see. It's a pity to write the magic on the sideboard, but oh well. There we go. What's the magic? So was that a question? Yeah, I had a question. If the group is semi-simple, say, is it, is, it, is it always going to be the case that there's this anis anisotropic constant of torus? No, I don't. Like, what's an example where there isn't any SL3, SL3 apparently. Yeah, okay. so... Oh, oh, I forget, it's the real <laughs> Yes, and the Galois group is very easy in the real world. <laughs> it's the real world. Yes, the real world. Oh, that's one big difference, that's for example. Difference. For Piatti groups, it's very different. We always have these elliptic turi. Well, so here comes the magic. So let's now move to the Piatti world. So let F be a finite extension of QP. Let P be very large. Later, I will make things more precise than very large, but that's for now we're very large so that we have an exponential map. So we are now in the Piatti world. And then the theorem, let me put down Ka Tasha Kaleta's name, but of course, it's often in math. This rests on a lot of, a lot of work of other mathematicians that I will introduce throughout the, the lecture series. So what is the theorem? The theorem is we basically have the same situation in the, real, in the periodic world. So um, there exists a notion and sorry, maybe before I write this down, so this 
this should be just the, the overview of the motivation. Afterwards, I'll slow down and start a bit with more basics that go into that. There exists a notion of so-called regular elliptic pairs. I think that's how they are called. Let me double check. No, tame elliptic, uh, I mixed the order. Elliptic, elliptic tame, elliptic regular pairs. Oh, and let me make one more assumption just to make my life easy. Let's assume that G splits over time extension, which is automatic if a P is large and the group is semi-simple. So there exists a the notion of time elliptic regular pairs, S comma theta, consisting of <coughs> where S is an elliptic maximal torus. <coughs> And now we always have them of G and theta. Theta is a nice character. So theta is the character of our P of the F points of this torus. That is nice. Uh, let me call it regular. Well, that's how it's called a regular character. But for this motivational part, let me not define what regular is. I can define that later. There exists such a pair, as a, a notion of a pair, where we call a character regular. It's somehow, think of the analog of theta lying inside the, the open part of the cone, and not on the walls. Um, to which we can attach. Now I want to, so I said, for the real group, we looked at discrete series. The reason we looked at it was because supercuspids doesn't exist. In the periodic world, we really want to focus on supercuspids, and they exist. There are plenty of. Sorry, I take it back. Supercuspids. I always like to say that, but it's not true. There are no supercuspidal representations unless G is a torus. So. Of course, since everything is induced from them, they must exist. But the claim was that they. Except for the obvious ones, there's nothing. The GLF is being compacted. So what? Com is compact mass mm, No, no, supercuspid is... No, I'm... <laughs> oh! Uh, <laughs> so that's the, you're right. So basically what all I meant is there are no interesting supercuspids. But in the periodic world, there are tons of them. And in particular, if we have a, a torus S that is elliptic, so it's anisotropic, but the center of the group, and a regular character, then to this, we can attach a um, supercuspid irreducible. All representations are also irreducible, unless I say that differently. Supercuspidal representation pi sub s comma theta that satisfies um, the following. It satisfies that if we calculate its character, so the character of this representation, if we calculate this at gamma, what is gamma? Gamma is Ah, oh, that's inconvenient. Uh, gamma is an element of our our torus that is regular, semi-simple. And moreover, we want this element to be also topologically 
semi-simple. And topologically semi-simple means, i.e., it should have finite order mod center co-prime to p, and should add mod center as well. I was thinking to just ignore the center, but I decided to be kind and add it. Topologically semi-simple mod center, i.e., of finite order co-prime to p mod center. So that comes from the notion of a um, topological Jordan decomposition that I'll say a bit more next time. So for these nice elements of the torus, we have a character formula which looks as follows. There is, oh, it's not an A, it's an E. And now I don't, I was afraid of writing down character formulas because I find them scary. So I asked you to not be scared of them. And uh, it doesn't really matter what all the signs are. I'm going to walk you through it or tell you what really matters. We have a Kotwitz sign, which came up somewhere in the course before in the summer school. Doesn't really matter too much, as I said. Then we have um, the root number of some virtual representation um, with respect to some character. Well, let me double check that I get the. No, I think it's the characters, not the co characters. So that's a virtual root number of this. Um, uh, sorry, it's a root number of this virtual rep Galois representation with respect to phi is some additive character of the field, T is the minimal levy inside the quasi-split group. Whatever it is, it's just the force root of unity. I, I don't ask you to digest all the constants, but I just want to write them down so it's, it's complete. Then we have another constant, which is uh, the discriminant, the square root of one over the discriminant. And then we have a sum. And what is the sum over? Well, the sum is over the same as over there. We sum over all the elements in the normalizer of S, mod out by S. So we, you see the similarity between these two. So there's some weird sign. And then there's a sum over the normalizer of the torus. And what do we sum over? We sum over, let me put this down here. Um, another sign here, uh, let me see, how is this called? I think it's called delta sub two upper apps for absolute. It's an absolute transfer factor attached to some data, some A data, some chi data. And I don't uh, expect you to know what that is. Um, and then the W conjugate of gamma. So that's again some sign. Let's just ignore that for now. And here comes the crucial thing. And then, and now I'm, I'm crossing out what I'm writing. That's not great. So, so this sign attached to, as I said, some A data, some chi data, whatever it is, some sign evaluated at the gamma conjugate. And then theta of W gamma. And I want to well, ask you to ignore all the details. Just look at the big picture of this formula. The big picture is it's a sum, like over there, the same type of sum. And then what do we sum? Well, we sum this, this character of the conjugates of gamma over the normalizer of the torus. And then there's some, well, I shouldn't call it garbage, some very important information here which is this stuff that I haven't really told you what it is. Well, it's a Kotzwitz sign, it's a root number, it's a discriminant, and an absolute transfer factor. But all that you should actually know about this is that this sign, let's see if I can copy it, E of G, the Kotzwitz number, the root number of something, um, the discriminant of gamma, and finally this transfer factor of well, some A data, some chi data of W gamma. So that's the blue part that looks so, I don't know, so scary. And so here comes the magic. 
all the scary thing, actually the scary thing is equal to if you now plug in the real numbers and interpret all these signs and expressions appropriately, then this whatever it is turns out to be minus one to one half the dimension of g over k times one over the product of um, the product over the positive roots. No, not the product. Oh yeah, the product of the positive roots of one minus alpha of w gamma inverse. So I hope you recognize something, unless I've done typos. So up to the typos that I've made on the blackboard, you will notice that this character formula in the periodic world is exactly the same as that character formula in the real world. Yes? Can you comment on why gamma has to be finite order? That seems like a, a strong restriction. So here was the, the comment that was made is, could I comment on why gamma has to have finite order? And so the answer is, because that's the motivational part of the talk. Um, so the real answer is, well, the periodic answer is, um, we have a character formula for all gamma, I mean, for more all gamma, it's more but it's more general and um, the non, so y you can decompose in general gamma into a topologically semi-simple and topologically in its potent part. And next time I will tell you the whole character formula. But this is the part that looks the same. That's the magic. But that's a good comment. So actually, there might be no gamma of that sort. So it's actually not telling us everything. But it's just such a nice similarity. There are some, yeah, so one can make, so I, there's the A data and the chi data. and we have precise choices for these. Uh, I mean, European they are. Question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 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 the question was <laughs> for those at home, I'm usually the person sitting in the back task to ask people to repeat the question. The question is there are choices in these A data and chi, chi data, and that yes, there are choices involved in that. Uh, I mean, there are. Yes. And I guess Tasha would call that they're natural in some sense. So they. Um, yes. So for like GL2 or GLN, like what is the, the Galois sign of this? Like what, what is the, the L parameter of this thing? What are the L parameters? So the question was what are the L parameters, for example, for GL2 or GLN? Um, so for GLN, these are actually, these representations are all the supercuspital representations. And the L parameters are precisely the supercuspital L parameters. Um, so there is that, the, the discrete parameter that are trivial on the SL2 part. So, so do I get it from taken by inducting some Galois character? Sorry? Do I build the, the Galois representation from taken by, by inducing it from the... Can I build the Galois representation of something something by something something theta? Can I build the Galois representation associated with by S theta by saying S is like uh, S is restriction of scalar from some... Yeah, so I, I guess the question is a bit, how do I build the Galois representation out of that? Um, let me say just a few words and I can answer more later. It basically uses the, the local Langlands correspondence for a torus and a character, and then one, just ha so one ha has just to embed the L groups appropriately to, to make an L parameter out of it. Happy to talk more about it later, but I want to get a bit further if people allow me. All right, so that's the, that's the magic. And now I want to tell you a bit about, so, oh, let me first finish this. So th these representations, so these representations, pi sub s theta are called, Natasha Kalitha called them regular supercuspital representations. And that's actually, uh, since the question was asked, that's class of representations for which we know also the, the Langlands parameters. They are all supercuspital Langlands parameters. Not all of them, I mean, in general, we don't capture all of them. There's a different notion. I can say more about this in the Q&A. So that means we now have some 
regular supercuspidal representations as a subclass of our supercuspidal representations. And as I've already mentioned, these are actually equal if G is equal to GLN. But in general, that's a strict inclusion. But what I wanted to moderate for you is that there's, there seems to be some magic going on. And I wanted to give you a motivation for the rest of the talk, which will be about the construction of these supercustom representations. So there's a big difference between the real world and the periodic world. Well, there are tons of differences. When you say GLN, is this still under the hypothesis that P is large? Oh, yes, yeah, all this P is very large. Yeah. I mean, there, you don't even need to get go that large, but for the character formulas, yeah. So, to be precise, P doesn't divide. Um, but P larger than N is safe. Uh, um, but not for the character formulas because the exponential map is required. Okay, more questions at that point that are urgent. So I wanted to say some, some big picture things. So I started with the real world. In the real world, people started actually the way I've done it, started writing down, should be somewhere I think, wherever it is, here, Harishandra's theory. People started writing down the character formula. So Harishandra found all the characters. And then it took mathematicians much longer to actually construct these representations. So I think Schmidt has done some important work in the 70s to actually construct these representations that have the, this character that Harishandra found. And well, I'm sure I'm, there have been many other mathematicians working on that as well. In the periodic world, it has been the other way around. I'm now presenting it to you as Oh, we have a character formula. Can we find some representations with this nice character formula? But that's not actually how history went. In the periodic world, people first tried to construct supercustal representations and later calculated the character formulas. And then Tasha observed this nice property that this magic happens, that they are actually the same. And so what I want to do is tell you about the construction of these supercustal representations now. So construction of supercuspidal representations. And for that, I want to go to the slightly more general setting that F is now a non-Archimedean local field. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the setting I want to work in. And there's a folklore conjecture. So as I said, these supercuspid representations are very mysterious. At Corvallis, we didn't know really how to write them down. But there's a folklore conjecture that they are all of the following shape. They are all compactly induced. So the folklore conjecture is that all irreducible, I won't write irreducible anymore, most likely, all supercuspidal representations of the periodic group. So I call it periodic group, but I allow also e the equal characteristic case are of the form uh, compact induction from some compact mode center open subgroup to the whole group itself. So K is compact mod center open subgroup of G. Now, now rather general of G of F. Of a representation rho, where well rho is some irreducible representation of K. Some finer dimensional irreducible representation. And the conjecture is that all supercuspid representations are of this form. So let me just write this out just once since no one has ever written this out so that you can take a break. So these are all the functions from the group to the vector space of V rho such that we have the normal uh, induction conditions so that Fk of G is equal to rho of K, F of G for all k inside k and g inside g of f. And 
the function is compactly supported. So that's the conjecture that all supercuspular representations are of this form. They are compactly induced from a representation of a compact open subgroup. And well, we know this conjecture in a lot of cases. Um, let's see, I have to start to erase. Okay, this is. All right, so known cases. By known cases, I mean, i.e., we know explicit constructions of supercuspular representations, and I should say of all supercuspular representations, in the following cases. We know it for GLN. That's the first thing that people worked at. So it started, maybe a lot of people have worked on it, so I'm sh I will definitely omit people. Um, but so how and more I have, have done some ground um, lying work at the beginning that how his work was around the Corvallis con. Yes? Sorry, so maybe a dumb question about the compact induction. There's a question about the compact induction. Is there some continuity assumption on the f? Is there a continuity assumption? This will be automatic by the compactly supported. Um, that should be automatic. But yeah, you can also write this down um, to put down a that these functions are locally constant. But this is given by compactly supported together with this condition implies it. Excellent question. So I don't know if I repeated the question, but the answer is these functions have to be locally constants, which they are automatically. Yes. Then it's compactly supported mod center. Oh yeah, sorry. Compactly supported mod center. I tend to do everything is always mod center. Well, not everything, but <laughs> sorry. Um, all right, more questions. So it started with work of Howe and Moy and well, a lot, a lot of people. And then Bushnell and Kutzko, they wrote a book in the Orange uh, Manals and Mass series in 1993 in which they constructed all the supercuspular representations. So that means GLN is done. Uh, classical groups, and by classical groups, if P is not equal to 2, I mean fixed points of an involution inside GLN. So symplectic, orthogonal, and unitary groups. That was done by Sean Stevens. Um, I think that was 2008. Then we have inner forms of GLN. That was done by C. Sharon Stevens around 2008 as well. And so all these rely on GLN and GLN being invertible n by n matrices. And then they use some lattice theoretic um, anal analysis. And the question was, how do we go on beyond GLN? How do we capture all the representations? And so a big breakthrough was um, done for, for general G by uh, Moy and Prasad who introduced the moi passat filtration, which is based on bert tietz theory. And that's what I want to introduce after finishing this blackboard. And they then studied all the depth zero representations. And I'm going to tell you what they are once I've defined what the moi passat filtration is. So that was 94, 96. And I should also mention Morris, who has done the same roughly around the same time in 99, using some different techniques. And so the most general thing that's known today, I think, is for general groups, G 
So that's step zero, but also we can do general um, representations if we assume that G splits over time extension and the prime number P, the residue field characteristic, I don't even know if I introduced that, so let me, let me say F is a non-Archimedean local field, so F contains a ring of integer O, contains a uniformizer pi, and the residue field is FQ, and its characteristic of FQ is P. And so if P doesn't divide the order of the Weil group, so that's the, the Weil group of G, so for GLN, that's the symmetric group on n letters. It's n factorial. For classical groups, this is excluding all the primes up to n. For exceptional groups, for E8, in the worst case, you exclude the primes 2, 3, 5, 7. Nothing more. Under this assumption, we get all this. We know how to write down all the supercuspid representations. And that, I should also add names. I was told to add names. As I said, I'll always, I'm sure there are many names missing here. Um, let me start with the name Adler, who gave a rather general construction in his thesis in 98. Then JKU generalized this construction vastly in 2001. And this is the construction that I'm talking about, the construction that is exhaustive. Um, he gave a construction, and then Julie Kim proved in 2007 that if the prime p is very large and the, uh, the local field has characteristic zero, then this result is true, and while well, it holds also in full generality. Oops, not in 2001, I wasn't there yet in math. So that's, that's the state of the art, that we know how to construct all the supercuspular representations if we assume that the group splits over time extension and p doesn't divide the order of the Weil group. And a large subclass of those are these regular supercuspid representations that look the same as the discrete series representations, the nice discrete series representations in the real world. Yes? So if I take any group G, is it likely to split over the time extension, or is that restricted? The question is, if I take any group G, is it likely to split over time extension? The answer is, if G is semi-simple, so we ignore the center, then the assumption that P doesn't divide the order of the Weil group implies that the group splits over time extension. I'm only putting this down because you, the set, you can do ba bad things to the center. Just take, a, just take your favorite group and multiply it with a torus that only splits over wide extension, and there you go, you have something that splits only over wide extension. But it's not really much, it's essentially the same as P doesn't divide the order of the Weil group. All right, so what I like to do now is to guide you into how to construct some of these representations. How do these mysterious objects look like that have this nice character formula? And well, how do we do it? We do it by following the folklore conjecture. So what do we need? We need to find nice compact open subgroups and representations of them so that we can compactly induce. All right. Let me start with a fact. The fact is that actually, if the compact induction from a compact mod center open subgroup to the whole group of a representation rho is irreducible, then it is supercuspidal. And the reason for that is exercise, well, the hint for the exercise is there are two, several ways to define supercuspidal. One is that it's not uh, contained in the parabolic induction of a proper parabolic subgroup. Another way to define it is by saying that all the matrix coefficients are compactly supported mod center. And that's 
using that, it's an easy exercise to show. So really, that's what we are want to do. So what we really want to do now is to find these nice compact open subgroups, and that's the, the more Prasad filtration that was introduced in the, in the 90s, so after Corvallis. And so that builds on the Brett Tietz theory. Brett Tietz theory and more Prasad filtration. So, Brett Teeth's theory, there's an article in Corvallis which is a common introductory article. Um, I was told I can assume everything that's in there, but let me not do that. Um, but also, I, uh, well, I have just given the whole lecture course series on it, so I won't spend four 15 weeks on it either. So what is the Brett Teeth's building? The Brett Teeth's building, I write it as B of G or B of GF. What is this? Well, it's a building, but what is a building? A building is a lot of real vector spaces of the same dimension that are glued together. So, for example, it's a, uh, sorry for hiding, it's a lot of lines that are glued together, which is an infinite tree. So, a lot of real lines that are glued together, that's a bridge Dietz building. And what is so nice about it? Well, the group acts on it, and that encodes compact subgroups. That was the idea of Brett and Tietz. And so what, what does it actually mean to give a point in the Brett Tietz building? To give a point in the Brett Tietz building, what we actually just need for the representation theory is that this amounts to the following data. It corresponds to three things. And for na from now on, for this section, I assume that G is split, just to make my life easier. It amounts to T choosing a maximal torus. T is a maximal split torus. In pictures, choosing a maximal split torus T amounts to choosing one of the lines. So say T corresponds to this line here. That's what T corresponds to. The second piece of information is called Capital X alpha, what is this? Capital X alpha, you choose one for every element in the root system. And these are basis elements of the Lie algebra of the group on which the torus acts by the root alpha. So that's a one dimensional space. And you just take a basis element. And you take a particular nice element, which is called a Chevalier basis. And that means you choose all these elements so that. If you let the Galois group act on it, these elements get preserved up to plus minus one. So that's again, that's, these, that's just something technical, which we do in the background, and you don't have to worry too much about it. And this corresponds to choosing a base point. So that corresponds to choosing a base point on this blue line. And so the real important thing when you want to construct the moi Prasad filtration is the third piece of information. And I just call this x again. I hope that doesn't cause confusion. And what is x? x is an element of the core characters of the torus. So that's a, a z lattice, a free z module. And I tend this up to the real numbers. And so this x here really amounts to now, we have here a real line. This real line is identified with this Real vector space and x just means you choose a point on here. So let's say that would be x, which would be, say, one fourth alpha shek as an example. So the bridge sheets building, all the information you need to construct a moi Passat filtration is choose a maximum torus means choose a line or a more general higher dimensional vector space. Choosing Chevalier basis means choosing a base point because these are really affine spaces and not real vector spaces, so you turn the affine space into a real vector space. And then the real vector space is actually this vector space here, and you just pick a point inside there. And now, starting from that, we can construct the moi Prasad filtration. So now, fix such T x alpha and x, and then we construct the moi Prasad filtration. 
And so I'm going to give you the formal definition, and then I encourage you to work out examples or ask me for examples so that you actually see what happens. So here we go. My Prasad filtration. attached to this point x. So the first thing is we need to define a filtration of the torus. So we do two things. Define a filtration of the torus and of the root groups, and then we put everything together. The zeroth filtration subgroup is just the maximal compact or maximal bounded subgroup of T of F. So in other words, more precisely, it's all the elements T inside T of F, such that the valuation of chi of T is equal to zero for all characters chi of the torus. So all the homomorphisms of the torus into GM. Sorry, I don't know if we ever introduced that, so should have said that these are the homomorphisms of GM into the torus, the co-characters. That's the zeros filtration subgroup. And now if R is a positive real number, then the R's filtration subgroup are all those elements inside the zeros filtration subgroup, such that the valuation of chi of t minus 1 is greater or equal to R for all characters chi of the torus. That's the filtration on the torus. Let me give you the filtration on the root groups. And then homework is to work out examples. So root groups, say u alpha, where alpha is some root of our group. What are these root groups? Well, we know that the root groups, they are isomorphic to the additive group. We are in the split setting. But this isomorphism is non-canonical. But I want to choose one, and that what I call small x sub alpha. And how do I choose this? I choose it, choose it such that the derivative which is now a map from the Lie algebra of GA to the Lie algebra of UA. So that's just G sub A, the Lie algebra on which the torus X by alpha. Sorry, G sub alpha, not G sub A. This map should send one to the element X alpha that we have fixed, fixed above. So that's why if we have chosen this X alpha. Choosing this X alpha defines for us an isomorphism here. So it's, it's giving us a fixed, I mean, that's, that's what I meant. It's, it's, it's a choice of parametrization. It gives us a parametrization here. And using that, we can then define for our sum uh, real number. We can define the filtration subgroup of the root group u alpha. Now the point x matters at depths r to be equal to the image under this map of a uniformizer to the n times the ring of integers, where n is the smallest integer such that we have that alpha of x plus n is greater or equal to r. What does this mean? Well, r you know, n you know. Alpha is a root, so alpha is a character of the torus. x is by definition, there it is. It lies inside the co-character of the torus tensored with the real numbers. So a tensor, that's really, well, OK. Tensor with the real numbers. So I mean, I want to write it on the side, but I want to have space there. So it's tensor over the integers with the real numbers. And now between these two z modules, we have a pairing to the integers. And then we tensor this with the real number. So that's how we get a real number here. And we require this equation to hold. And then the last bit. And I said, really, work out examples, and then it becomes clear what's happening. The final definition now is that final two GXR, the Moipasat filtration subgroup, attached to the point x of depth r of the group G 
is whatever I spend generated by those by the R filtration subgroup of the torus and the U alpha XR for all alpha. And last bit of notation, GXR plus is the union over all the filtration subgroups that are um, GXS for S greater than R. So it's just GXR plus some, some very small epsilon. So I think I might have a minute left since we surely started a minute late to just, that's correct, it's around time, um, to just um, say a few words that, well, we, we'll use this filtration next time to construct representations. This filtration has a lot of nice properties. These are normal subgroups contained inside each other. The successive quotients are particularly nice. They are all a billion except for the first one, which is the F the FQ points of a finite group. And well, I'm happy to tell you more if you're interested in, but the important thing is that's what we are going to use next time to define the depths and construct representations. And uh, one more time, work out examples before Monday. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any short questions? So are depth zero representations uh, regular? Are depth zero representations regular? Um, no, not in general, only if we are, for example, in the case of GLN. So for depth zero representations, I can maybe give a short answer, rough answer. Depth zero representation correspond to a representation of finite groups of Lie type. These were constructed by Dean Lin and Lustig. Dean and Lustig defined so-called R sub T comma thetas. If theta is in general position so that the R sub T comma theta is an actual cuspal representation on the nose, then the regular supercuspal representations are the, in the depth zero case are the ones corresponding to those representations. Happy to say more in, in the Q&A. Um. What was our question? There's one here. Well, in this formula, what's the pi? In this formula, what's the phi? The phi here is just an additive character. Um. Yeah, but something we have to choose for n somehow. Yes, yeah, so even though I'm not sure if that number itself depends on it. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert about that number. That's in Covalence, I think. <laughs> but um, for all the construction that we are going to do, you will always choose this character anyway. So in the background, we will next time choose such a character. What's our question? No more question? Okay, so we resume at uh, 25 past.